Book 2, Chapter 7, Sir Percival of Wales In the wild forest of Wales there lived once a boy called Percival with his mother. Never another living soul did he meet for the first fifteen years of his life, nor did he learn anything of the ways of men and women in the world. But Percival grew strong and hardy in the wild wood, of deadly aim with the dart and simple of heart, honest and upright. Now one day as he wandered alone, discontented suddenly and longing for he knew not what, a new sound fell upon his ears, not the voice of any bird, nor the music of wind or water, yet music it was, of a kind that set his heart leaping, he knew not why. He paused listening in a leafy glade, and as he waited there five knights came riding towards him, their armor jingling and the bridles of their horses ringing like silver bells. "'Greetings, fair youth,' cried the first knight, reining in his steed and smiling down at Percival. "'Nay, look not so stricken with wonder. Surely you have seen our like before.' "'Indeed not,' said Percival. "'And, truth to tell, I know not what you are, unless you are you be angels straight out of heaven, such as those of whom my mother teaches me. Come tell me, noble sirs, do you not serve the king of heaven?' "'Him we do serve indeed,' said the knight, crossing himself reverently. And so also do all men who live truly in this realm of Logris. But on earth we serve his appointed emperor, the noble King Arthur, at whose round table we sit. It is he who made us knights, for that is what all, is all we are. And you too he will make a knight if you but prove yourself worthy of that great honor. How may I do that? asked Percival. Come to King Arthur at Caerleon, answered the knight. Tell him that I sent you thither, I, Sir Lancelot of the Lake, who, under King Arthur, rule this land of Pant, which is also called North Wales. Then he will set you such deeds to do, such quests to accomplish, as we of his court follow after all our days. And if you prove worthy, you will, he will make you a knight, but not in great deeds of arms lies the true worth of knighthood, rather in the heart of the doer of such deeds. If he be pure and humble, doing all things to the glory of God, and to bring that glory and that peace throughout all our holy kingdom of Logris. Then Sir Arthur bowed his head to Percival, and rode on his way, followed by the four other knights, leaving him rapt in wonder, but with a great longing and a great humility stirring deeply within him. Mother, cried Percival, excited as he came striding up the path to the little cave where they lived. Mother, oh mother, I have indeed met with wonders this day. <clears throat> They said they were not angels but knights, yet to me they seemed fairer than all the hosts of heaven, and one of them, the leader, Sir Lancelot was his name, said that I too could be a knight. Mother, I shall set out tomorrow morning and seek for King Arthur who dwells in Caerleon. Then Percival's mother sighed deeply, and she wept for a little while, knowing that the appointed time had come when she must lose her son. Indeed, at first she tried to persuade Percival to remain with her in the peace and safety of the forest, telling him of the dangers and sufferings that a knight must undergo. But all that she said only made Percival the more eager to set out on his quest, and at length she bowed her head quietly and gave him his way. Early on the, on the following morning, Percival clad himself in the simplest garments of skins, took a long sharp dart in his hand, and prepared to bid his mother goodbye. "'Go bravely forward, my son,' she said as she kissed and blessed him. "'Your father was the bravest and best of knights. "'Be worthy of him and of me. "'And if you live all your days in honor and purity, "'you too shall be numbered among the chosen few "'whose names will live forever among the true knights of Logris. "'Go on your way now, and remember that if dame or damsel "'ask your aid, give it freely, and before all else, seeking no reward. "'Yet you may kiss the maiden who is willing,' But take no more than a kiss unless it be a ring, but be that only when you place your own ring upon her finger. Beware in whose company you travel on your quest, and see to it that only worthy men come near to your heart. But above all, pray to God each day that he may be with you in all your deeds and pass not by church nor chapel without pausing a while in his honor. Very gravely Percival kissed his mother goodbye and set out through the forest, walking swiftly yet with his head bowed as he thought of the solemn things which she had said to him. But in a little while the spring came back into his step, and he went on his way, singing joyfully and tossing his long dart up into the air until the keen blade flashed like silver in the sunlight as he caught it and whirled it up again and again. The shadows were falling in long black folds between the trees and the sun, 
drew near to the western hills when Percival came suddenly to an open glade in the forest where the daisies clustered the green grass like snowflakes and saw a pavilion of silk pitched bef beside a twinkling stream. Be this church or chapel, thought Percival. It is wondrous fair, and I will go into it. Stepping softly over the threshold, he passed into the shadowy bower, and there stood in wonder, looking down upon the da a damsel, who lay sleeping on a couch of rich silk and samite, with one arm stretched out, one more white than the coverlet, and her hair lighting up the pillow like sunshine. Very gently Percival bent down over her, and took from, uh, took from her finger the one ring that she wore, a plain gold band set with a single red ruby. In its place he put his own gold ring, from which shone one white diamond, and the maiden's ring he set on his own finger. Then, still without waking her, he kissed her gently on the lips, and stole once more from the tent, his heart singing with a new wonder and a new longing. Deep into the forest went Percival, slept, then darkness fell, among the roots of a great oak tree, and with the first light was on his way again striding through the wood until he came to the wide road which led to Caerleon. At noon he reached the city gates, passed them without stopping, and in time found himself within the very castle. King Arthur, with many of his knights, sat feasting there that day, and the, for the time was Easter, and they had ceased from their labors for a little while. Percival stood by the door, marveling at all he saw, and envying even the serving men who waited upon the king and his company. And suddenly, as he stood there unobserved, all eyes turned towards the door as a great man in golden red armor strode unannounced into the hall. Now at that moment, Sir Kay was standing beside the king, holding in his hands the golden goblet from which it was Arthur's custom to pledge all his company ere the cup was passed round from hand to hand that each might drink to him and to the glory of the realm of Logris. "'Stay, you pack of wine-bibbing hinds!' roared the great red stranger. "'Here is a better than all of you!' And with that he snatched the goblet from Sir Kay, drained it at a draught, and with a great roar of laughter strode from the hall, with it still in his hand, leapt upon his horse, and galloped swiftly away. "'Now by my faith!' cried King Arthur, springing to his feet. "'This insult shall not go unpunished. Who will bring me back my cup?' Then every knight rose as one man and cried, Let this quest be mine! Not so, said King Arthur, motioning them to sit once more. Yonder red braggart is not worthy to fall at a king's hands. Let some humble squire follow and overthrow him, one who seeks to be made a knight, such a one who returns to my court wearing the red knight's armor and carrying my golden goblet I will knight forthwith. Then Percival sprang forward from his place by the doorway and stood in the midst, clad as he was in the skins of wild goats and with the long dart held in his hand. King Arthur, he cried, I'll fetch your cup. I want some armor, and that golden suit will do me very well. <clears throat> bah! exclaimed Sir Kay rudely. What can this miserable goat herd do against so great a knight? Who are you, fair sir? asked King Arthur, courteous, as always, to all men. My name is Percival, was the answer. I do not know who my father was, for I never saw him nor heard my mother speak of him, but she has brought me up in the forests of Wales, and I come now to ask you to make me a knight. <clears throat> make you a knight indeed, soft scoffed Sir Kay. Go and tend sheep on the mountains before yonder ram and the golden armor makes you run away in terror. A knight shall you be, said King Arthur, if you bring back my cup and return wearing the armor of the robber who has taken it. Lo now, this quest is yours. Follow it only and no other. I have no horse, said Percival. One shall be ready for you at the door, answered Arthur. Eat now swiftly and get you gone. But you need arms and weapons. I have my dart, interrupted Percival. As for armor, I'll wait until I can put on that golden suit which you all saw not long ago. When he, had eaten, when he had eaten, Percival rose to go, but as he passed on the hall, a damsel stood before him and cried aloud, The king of heaven bless you, Sir Percival, the best of knights. Be silent, witless wench, cried Sir Kay angrily, and he struck the damsel across the face. Beware of me when I return in my golden armor, said Percival, looking scornfully at Sir Kay. That unknightly stroke will I revenge with a blow that you will not lightly forget. Then he hastened from the hall, sprang upon the waiting horse, and rode away into the forest. 
Percival went much faster than the Red Knight, so that before sunset he overtook him as he rode quietly up a mountain path towards the lone gray tower outlined against the pale pink of the clouds. "'Turn, thief!' shouted Percival as soon as he was near enough. "'Turn and defend yourself!' A little way behind him three of King Arthur's knights reined in their horses to watch. They had followed all the way from Caerleon to see what would befall, Gawain, Ewain, and Gareth. But not even now did Percival know that they were there. Ha! said the Red Knight, wheeling his steed. What insolent boy are you, and why do you bid me stand? I come from King Arthur, answered Percival. Give me back the golden goblet which you stole this day at his feast. Moreover, you must go yourself to the court and do homage there. But first of all, you must yield to me and give me that fine suit of armor which you wear so proudly. And if I do not, asked the Red Knight, speaking quietly, but his eyes flashing with fury, like the lightning in the quiet sky before a mighty storm. Why, then I will kill you, and help myself to cup and armor, exclaimed Percival. Insolent child, roared the Red Knight in a voice of thunder. You have asked for death, now take it. With that, he set his spear in rest, and came down the hillside like a mighty avalanche, expecting to transfix his enemy as if he were a butterfly on a pin. But Percival leapt suddenly from his horse, so that the spear passed harmlessly over his head, and stood in the middle of the path, shouting taunts. "'You great coward!' he jeered. First you try to spear an unarmed man, and then you run away down the hillside?' With horrible oaths, the Red Knight wheeled his horse once more and came charging up the path his spear aimed at Percival. But this time Percival drew back his dart and threw it suddenly, so suddenly that it sped like a flash of light over the Red Knight's shield and caught him in the throat just above the rim of his armor, so that he fell backwards from his horse and lay there dead. Percival knelt down triumphantly beside his fallen foe and drew out King Arthur's golden cup from the wallet at his waist. But when he tried to loosen the golden armor from the body, he found himself defeated, for he did not know how it was fastened on, and thought indeed that it was all made in one piece. After many vain attempts to pull the red knight through the uh, gorget or neck piece of the armor, Percival changed his tactics. Swiftly he gathered together a pile of dry wood, and was busily striking a flint from the road against the point of his dart, when suddenly he heard the sound of a horse's hooves, and looking up saw an old man on horseback dressed in dark armor, whose helmet hung at his saddle bow, and whose gray ha hair fell to his shoulders. "'Greetings, young sir,' said the old knight, smiling kindly upon Percival. "'What do you with this dead robber whom you have slain so valiantly?' "'Out of the iron... Uh, out of the iron burn the tree, said Percival, quoting a woodman's saying, which his mother had taught him. I want to get this man out of the armor and, I, and wear it myself. The old knight's smile grew broader still, but he dismounted from his horse and showed Percival how to unlace the armor and draw it off on and on piece by piece. <clears throat> My name is uh, Gonmans, said the knight presently, and I dwell nearby in an ancient manor house. Come you thither with me, young sir, and I will teach you all things that you should know before you become a worthy knight, for not alone by such a deed as this may you win to the true honor. So Percival went with Sir Gonmans, and dwelt on that summer, dwelt all that summer in his house, learning to fight with sword and spear, to wear his armor, and to sit his horse as a knight should. And he learnt also of the high order of knighthood, which was so much more noble than the mere doing of mighty deeds. He learnt of right and wrong, and of, of a knight's duty ever to defend the weak and punish the cruel and evil. And at last he rode forth on his way once more, clad in shining armour, with a tall spear in his hand, after bidding a courteous farewell to Sir Gonimans. It was late autumn by now, and as he rode beneath the trees in the deep woods and forests, the leaves gleamed red and gold like his armor, which seemed almost to be part of the foliage and bracken through which he passed. Many days rode Percival in quest of adventure, and often he, as he went his eyes fell upon the ruby ring on his finger, and he thought more and more of the lovely damsel whom he had found sleeping in the pavilion. At length on a dark, somber evening when the clouds lowered threateningly above him, he came by a winding way among great bare rocks through a sad and desolate land until suddenly... He saw a dark castle in front of him. The walls were shattered, were 
uh, shattered and overthrown. The towers were cracked down the sides as if by lightning. Yet no weeds grew among the stones or even between the cobbles under the yawning gateway. And in the center stood the great keep, firm and solid in the midst of that desolation. Beneath the sharp teeth of the portcullis rode Percival, his horse's hooves ringing hollowly on the stone, and on through dark arches and deserted courtyards until he came to the entrance of the great hall. Here he could see a light burning, and so, having tied his horse to a ring in the wall, he walked up the steps and into a mighty room with a high roof of black beams. There was no one to be seen, and yet a fire burned merrily in the great fireplace. Torches shone brightly from rings in the walls, and dinner was set at a table on the dais. Percival walked slowly up the hall and stood looking about him. On a little table, not far from the fire, he saw laid out a set of great ivory chessmen, with a chair drawn up on one side as if ready for a game. While still wondering what all this might mean, Percival sat down in the chair, and presently he reached out idly and moved a white pawn forward two squares on the board. At once a red pawn moved forward by itself. Percival was alert in an instant, but all this, but all was quiet. There was not even the sound of any breath but his own. So he moved another piece, and immediately a red piece was moved also. Percival moved again as if playing, and behold, the red pieces moved in turn so cunningly that in a very few minutes he saw that he was checkmated. Swiftly he rearranged the pieces, and this time the red moved first, and a second game was played, which Percival also lost. The third time this happened, and Percival rose in a sudden fury, drawing his sword to crush the pieces and hack the board. But as he did so, a damsel ran suddenly into the room. "'Hold your hand, Sir Knight,' she cried. If you strike at these magic chess pieces, a terrible evil will befall you. Who are you, lady? asked Percival. I am Blanche Fleur, she answered, and as she spoke, she came forward into the light of the candles which stood near to the chess table, and with a sudden gasp of wonder and joy, Percival knew her for the maiden in the pavilion, and even as he recognized her, he saw his diamond ring shining on her finger. He held out his hand to her and saw her suddenly, pause as she recognized her own ring which he still wore lady blanchefleur he said gently i have sought for you long my name is percival and i beg you to pardon me for the wrong i did you meaning no wrong when i took this ring from you as you slept and took also one kiss from your lips percival she answered gently i have seen you only in dreams each night you have come to me wearing my ring and have kissed me once on the lips and my heart has gone out to you across the darkness but in this magic castle i have waited for you the time to speak of love is not yet come sit down to supper for you shall see a more wondrous thing than yonder enchanted chessboard they took their places at the table, but there was no food nor wine upon it, nor did, it, did any man or woman come to wait upon them. Yet Percival sat silent, looking at Blanchefleur. Lady, he said at length, all times are the true time for such a love as mine. Lady, will you be my wife? I swear to you that no other in all the world shall come near me, nor shall my lips touch those of any save you alone. Blanchefleur laid her hand on his with never a word, and as she touched him, suddenly a great roar of thunder shook the castle. The great door of the hall flew open, and a strange damsel, dressed and veiled in white, walked slowly into the hall, holding aloft a great goblet or grail covered in a cloth. A light shone from within the grail so bright that no man might look upon it, yet it was with another and a holy awe that Percival sank to his knees and bowed his head in his hands. A second veiled woman followed the first bearing a golden platter, and a third followed her carrying a spear with a point of white light from which dripped blood that vanished ere it touched the floor. As they passed up the hall and round the table where Percival and Blanchefleur knelt, the whole room seemed to be filled with sweet scents as of roses and spices, and when the procession of the grail had passed down the hall once more and out of the door, which closed again behind them, there fell upon Percival a peace of heart that passed all understanding and a great joy. The Holy Grail draws near to Logris, said Blanchefleur. Ask me no more concerning what you have seen, for the time has not yet come. One other must enter this castle and see it, and that is Sir Lancelot of the Lake. But Percival, you are more blessed than he, for through him shall come the ending of the glory of Logris. 
though in Logris there has no there has so far been none so glorious as he, save only Gawain. Go you now to Camelot and wait for the coming of Galahad. On the day when he sits in the siege perilous, you shall see the Holy Grail once more. Lady, said Percival, rising to his feet, but standing with bowed head, I would seek for it now. It seems to me that there is no quest in all the world so worthy. No quest indeed, answered Blanchefleur, but not yet may you seek it. On the day when the glory of Logris is at its full, the Grail shall come to Camelot. Then all shall seek, but only the most worthy shall find it. I would be one of those, cried Percival. None but I shall achieve the quest of the grail. And forgetting all else, he ran down the hall, never heeding Blanchefleur's cry, leapt upon his horse and galloped away into the forest. When the morning came, the madness seemed to leave him suddenly, and turning round, he tried to ride back to, in search of Blanchefleur. But, though he wandered for many, many days, he could never again find any trace of the desolate land or of the mysterious castle of Carbonek. Sad and wretched, Percival turned at length and rode towards Caerleon. It was winter now, and the snow lay thick on the high road as Percival came out from the mountains and forests of central Wales and drew near to the city. One night he slept in <clears throat> at Tin Turn on the Wye, and early next day rode slowly and sadly down the valley by the bright river. Suddenly as he went he saw a hawk swoop from above like a shining bolt of brown and strike a dove. For a moment the two birds fluttered together in midair, and then the hawk flew triumphant up once more, bearing his victim in his claws. But from the dove's breast fell three drops of blood, which lay and glistened in the white snow at Percival's feet. And as he looked, he thought of the blood that fell from the spear at Castle Carbonek. He thought of the ruby ring on his finger, but most of all he thought of Blanche Fleur, of her red lips, red as blood, and of her skin like the white snow. As he sat there on his horse, four knights came riding towards him, and these were Sir Kay, Sir Ewain, and Sir Gawain, and King Arthur himself. Ride forward now, said King Arthur to Sir Kay, and ask yonder knight his name, with his journeys, and why he sits thus in thought. Ho, oh, Sir Knight, shouted Kay as he drew near, tell me your name and business. But, Sir, but Percival was lost so deeply in his thoughts that he never saw nor heard. "'Answer if you be not a dumb man,' shouted Kay. And then, losing his temper somewhat, he struck at Percival with his iron gauntlet. Then Percival sat upright on his horse, reined backwards a little way, set his spear in rest, and cried, "'No man shall strike me thus and go unpunished. Defend yourself, you cowardly craven knight.' Sir Kay drew back also, leveled his spear, and they galloped together with all their strength. Sir Kay's spear struck Percival's shield and broke into pieces. But Percival smote so hard and truly that he pierced Kay's shield, wounding him deeply in the side and hurling him to the ground. Then he sat with his spear ready in case one of the other knights should attack him. "'I will joust with all or any of you,' he cried. "'I will defend my right to sit my horse by the roadside without having to suffer the blows and insults of such a shameful knight as this.' "'It is Percival,' exclaimed Sir Gawain suddenly. "'He who slew the Red Knight, whose armor now he wears. "'Truly he must have been lost in the deep thoughts of love "'to sit as he did while Sir Kay struck him.' "'Ask him to speak with us, fair nephew,' said King Arthur, "'and Gawain rode forward towards Percival. "'Gentle sir,' said he with all courtesy, "'yonder is King Arthur, our sovereign lord, "'and he desires, to speak with you, <clears throat> desires you to speak with him. "'As for Sir Kay, whom you have smitten down, well... He deserves this punishment for his lack of knightly gentleness. When Percival heard this, he was glad. Then we are both, then are both mine oaths fulfilled, he cried. I have punished for Sir Kay for the evil blow he gave the damsel on the day when I came first to Caerleon, and I come before King Arthur wearing the armor of the red knight whom I have slain and carrying in my wallet the golden goblet which was stolen from his board. Percival rode forward, dismounted from his horse, and knelt before King Arthur. Lord King, he said, make me a knight, I pray you, and here I swear to spend all my days in your service, striving to bring glory to the realm of Logris. Arise, Sir Percival of Wales, said King Arthur. Your place awaits you at the round table, between Sir Gawain and the siege perilous. <clears throat> in the days long past, Merlin the good enchanter told me that you would come when the highest moment of the realm of Logris drew near. Then Sir Percival rode to Caerleon between King Arthur and Sir Gawain, 
while Sir Uwain followed after them, leading Sir Kay's horse while Sir Kay lay groaning across its saddle. Many deeds did Sir Percival after this, but there is no space to tell of his adventures with Rosette the loathly damsel, how he fought with the knight of the tomb who lived in a great cromlech on a mountain of Wales, how he overcame Partinius and Arids, King Margon and the witch of the waste city. But always he sought for the Lady Blanchefleur, always he was true to her alone, but he could not find her, until the years were accomplished, and he found his way once more to the castle of Carbonek, not long after the Holy Grail came to Camelot. <laughs>